Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Ocean and Coastal Day of the Race to Zero Dialogues. My name is Christian Teleki. I am the director of the Friends of Ocean Action at the World Economic Forum. Delighted that you could join us and we do hope that this finds you safe and well wherever you may be in the world. Today is the third day being hosted by the World Economic Forum as a contribution to the Race to Zero Dialogues of the many of dialogues that are going on uh, during these two weeks. Many exciting sessions and not the least of which is the ocean and delighted to be able to have a full day of sessions and kicking off today with some very interesting and engaging panelists and remarks to hopefully set you up for the day in participating in some of the other sessions. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Race to Zero global campaign, it's an incredible initiative that we'll hear more about from our high level champions that really is rallying leadership to support um, the Race to Zero from many cities, over 450 cities, 22 regions, or a thousand businesses, 45 big investors, and if that wasn't enough, over 550 universities that are really trying to drive for a healthy, resilient, zero carbon recovery that prevents not only future threats, but creates decent jobs and unlocks inclusive, sustainable growth, which I think we all you know, want to aspire to, especially in these times and what COVID has shown us with the relationship between humanity and nature. Certainly the objective is this is to build momentum and shift to a decarbonized economy ahead of COP26 and where governments must strengthen their contributions to the Paris Agreement. And certainly we've been afforded the luxury of time um, for a year leading into next uh, to the next COP to really consider some of these issues and really mobilize action, not the least of which is around two thirds of the planet, the ocean. Um, and for a long time, the ocean perhaps is not considered as part of the mainstream, perhaps out of sight and out of mind in many discussions, not the least of which has been in the climate. And thanks to many of you on the line and champions that are taking this forward are raising this higher on the agenda. We saw this most recently in uh, COP25 uh, that was hosted by Chile, calling it the blue COP, really bringing the ocean into the climate into the climate domain and getting, we're all, I think we're all getting very excited about the potential for COP26. I think many of you may not realize the extent the ocean role has in regulating our climate, but has an enormous influence on, on weather patterns across the globe. And we're seeing this time and time again, uh, the influence that the ocean is having on, on our climate. I think, you know, hopefully you'll be aware that the ocean has absorbed approximately 90% uh, of the excess heat that we're producing and over 30% of the carbon generated from human activities, which are dampening much of the impacts that we'd otherwise experience on land. However, uh, we do know that the ocean is in trouble and this certainly is compromising um, the uh, its ability to withstand the impacts of, of climate change and certainly to continue to provide the resources that support local livelihoods viable infrastructure, national security, global economies, our health, et cetera. And so there's an intimate linkage here between ocean health plan and planetary health and indeed human health um, that we certainly need to strengthen. Um, the good news, um, hopefully you all have seen is that recent research commissioned by the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy found that ocean-based climate action can play a much bigger role um, in shrinking the world's carbon footprint that was previously thought. In this analysis, it was shown that it could deliver up to a fifth, that's 21% or 11 gigatons of CO2 of annual greenhouse gas uh, emission cuts needed by 2020 to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And if you think about this, part of, of this would be to move to ocean-based renewable energy technology, such as offshore wind, uh, wave, tidal, et cetera, that is, would be displacing coal-fired uh, power plants and the total mitigation potential for the sector could be equal to taking over 1 billion cars off the road per year. That's 1 billion cars, cars off the road per year. So it really behooves us to really think about the ocean and the, the role the ocean can play uh, in uh, combating climate change. And indeed, uh, we'll hear more about this from our very distinguished panelists um, that we have here today. Um, we're really fortunate that the Race to Zero Dialogues uh, considered that we could be able to reach a broader audience and allowing us to raise this issue uh, with more governments and industry and communities around the world um, so that we can better understand the state of the ocean and the need for putting this firmly in the heart of the agenda of climate change going forward. 
it certainly is an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to call for the potential, not think about necessarily imp impacts, but think about the solutions, how we can mitigate climate change impacts and strengthen ocean resilience, as well as indeed our own resilience to climate change. So we need to think about really the connection, as I mentioned earlier, about humanity, people, economy, they are connected and we need to consider it as such. Um, we would really like to thank our, our high level champions for hosting this ocean and, and coastal day event in the Race to Zero Dialogues. Um, Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz, um, I, I hope you all, uh, if, if you haven't um, uh, met them and get to know them, I encourage you to do so. They have an enormous amount of energy and drive to really see uh, these issues come to the forefront and we want to empower them. We wanna support them, we wanna help them um, to, to really uh, move this agenda along. Um, we are entering into some uh, new territory, we hope, uh, where the world, uh, indeed globally, and some of the big powers are going to be start really perhaps changing their views and really embracing the solutions of what uh, climate change, um, uh, towards climate change. So with that, I am uh, delighted to uh, welcome uh, Nigel and Gonzalo to kick things off with some opening remarks. So gentlemen, over to you. Thank you so much, Christian, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, as, as Christian said, welcome to uh, our fourth day of the Races Your Dialogues, as he said, the third one at the WEF house. Uh, today is our blue day and totally connected, as, as Christian said, to the blue COP, to COP25, but heading to COP26. We are now opening our Oceans and Coastal Zone Day, starting, of course, by thanking the Friends of Ac uh, Ocean Action, the World Economic Forum, the Blue uh, Climate Initiative, and the Ocean and Climate Platform for putting this critical topic of oceans and coastal zones in the race to zero emissions. Uh, today, we will explore how oceans and coastal zones can and must help us accelerate climate action, enhance communities' uh, resilience, and contribute to our efforts to build this healthy, resilient, zero carbon future that we are building from the non-state actors perspective, helping uh, nations, helping the parties to increase their ambition, to increase their action, noticing that there are so many capacities to be contributed from the oceans and coastal zones uh, sector. Today, we have no doubt that uh, investing in sustainable blue economy activities can be one of the most economically efficient means of uh, recovering from the global pandemic. Uh, we have to tackle climate change through the increment of the health of oceans. And, and, and we have to frame the vision of today's theme and draw on the oceans and coastal zone climate action pathway that have set out the blueprint of how to make this vision a reality. Thanks, Gonzalo. And I think at the heart of the climate action pathways is this idea of systemic change that um, the kind of transformations we're talking about require actors they require people across along value chains, policymakers, civil society, cities, investors, all to change in concert to play their role. Um, and that's why the idea of the pathways is so crucial in driving what we call the ambition loop. So that as well as the long-term vision and long-term goals, we have very specific actions which people are going to take in the next five years. And you know, our intention is to get to Glasgow with as many of you as possible in the race to zero and sending very clear signals about what you are already doing so that governments get that message and that we can include action on oceans into um, national uh, mitigation adaptation plans. Um, uh, mainly here to listen today, but some of the things that I'm really looking forward to are hearing more about the role of healthy ecosystems in storing carbon, you know, whether it's mangrove forests, seagrass meadows or saltwater marshes being protected and restored. Um, and as well as storing carbon, we know, as um, Christian alluded to, there's many uh, economic um, and, and human benefits in terms of flood protection, storm protection, and healthy and sustainable li livelihoods. Also looking forward to hearing more about the marine linked industries, whether it's offshore energy, um, uh, shipping, I mean, some great progress in the Getting to Zero Coalition really, and getting a really clear roadmap together for the shipping industry to get to zero. And um, interesting collaborations like, like CBOS, bringing together the leading fishing industry players that could perhaps up their ambition to commit to net zero. So, Really looking forward to um, learning a lot more from all the stakeholders um, on track for uh, an oceans race to zero and the rest of today. Gonzalo. Yeah, man, and as you said, I mean, it's time not, I mean, there's no room 
for a siloed mindset uh, to solve challenges like uh, the ones related to our topic, radical collaboration between different stakeholders and different sectors, absolutely critical. And, and oceans and, and coastal zones are one very concrete way to, to set that logic, right? When you see the connection between uh, oceans and energy, oceans and transport, oceans and food, uh, that shows us the need of setting the radical collaboration. So we are, as you said, uh, seeing great advances in transport and sustainable fuel. We also see the need of investing and put capital towards ending overfishing, restoring mangroves, expanding offshore wind, uh, decarbonizing shipping. All of that will require uh, investment with, the, with, with this intention of solving uh, the, the climate crisis that are related to ocean. We need to start this today. We, we cannot wait for 2050. Uh, we need to, to take this into a trans transformative action. Uh, and, 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 and we know, for example, how much of tidal facilities and offshore wind farms will play an important role in the global clean electricity mix. Uh, but as, as I said before, we need to scale up the investment and the vision to create this future now. When it comes to job creation connected to uh, the COVID-19 crisis, all marine linked industries should provide healthy, sustainable jobs for local communities, as, as Kristen mentioned. In this moment, when, when job recovery is so critical, all marine linked industries should contribute to a recovery from coronavirus in the short term and to create our zero carbon economy in the long term. We need to globally invest in nature-based solutions, and we know that oceans provide us with numerous nature-based solutions to, to climate change. It's a, it's a perfect connection between climate and diversity, right? So uh, we, we can say also that the ocean crisis and the climate crisis are just two sides of the same coin. Yeah, um, th thanks, Gazal. Just, just Christina, last thought, um, and then to hand back to you. Um, We've called these two weeks the race to zero dialogue. So yes, the emphasis is on the race to zero, the specific actions that we can urgently take to get on the on track. But I also just like to point to the importance of the word dialogue. You know, we're, we're all trained to debate ideas um, and to win arguments. And the word debate etymologically comes from the same root as batter. It's a confrontation, a debate with a winner and a loser. So we're really looking forward to dialogues, which is an opportunity to take a to slow down a little bit, not feel the need to be right and to win an argument, but to really concentrate on listening to each other. And, and in particular, notice where we disagree, because um, in in the areas where we disagree, there's when we listen to each other, there's a huge opportunity for learning. And it's only if we learn together, it's only as we learn together that we'll be able to make these these systems transformations that we need. So um Really looking forward to learning a lot. It's an incredible day you guys have put together and look forward to working with you to make sure that we can tell the story in Glasgow of a world with a clear plan and decisive action already being taken to win the ocean um, track of the race to zero. Thanks, Christian. Well, fantastic, Nigel and Gonzalo. What, uh, as you can see, hopefully people on the line, what terrific energy um, and inspiring words uh, these two gentlemen have. And, uh, and I think... You know, it's a it's a great way to remind us, Nigel, uh, about you know this in terms of dialogue. Um, you know, this is very much about opening doors and and bridging, you know, building bridges and and establishing uh, relationships and conversations where it's not just about um, you know driving home, you know, uh, and battering people with statistics and and you know, but it's it's really thinking about those solutions and uh, that we are in this together. And so I think um, I'm hoping that that certainly over over the course of the day, uh, we'll be able to provide uh, insights um, and deliver perhaps some ideas, um, really concrete ideas of where we can have a commonality of purpose and meaning and understanding that we are all in this together. And in fact, we can address this uh, together um, as a great lead into, um, uh, into COP26 next year. I, I would also suggest, if I may, um, you know, while we do still have Gonzalo and, and Nigel here, that that, that and maybe perhaps a plea um, that uh, we use upcoming ocean events um, and uh, as sort of milestones to keep this conversation going um, and keeping others engaged um, to remind people the importance of the ocean. So we certainly have a great bill leading into uh, COP26 and that 
the important that that sort of governments and, and parties are hearing the importance that the ocean plays in our in our daily lives. Um, and, and it's not just a one set of people that are that are driving that forward. So we're certainly looking to you for um, for uh, for helping us with that. So again, thank you. St thank you so much. Plea heard, plea heard, Christian. We look forward to working with you to keep that drumbeat going. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, well, listen, we uh, have got an incredible panel um, of, of, uh, uh, for you right now. Um, I, I worked out that they are spanning 12 time zones. Um, and this is called dedication, folks. Um, we've got uh, Daniela Fernandez, who uh, is just past two o'clock in the morning for her. She's the chief executive officer of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, doing great work um, for a number of years now on innovators, really mobilizing uh, youth communities. We'll hear from her in, in a moment. Uh, we then have uh, Kim Kupanas, who's the global ambassador for B-Lab. Um, I reckon it's about three o'clock in the morning for her. Um, and then uh, moving swiftly into Europe, uh, probably no introduction needed, but I'm going to uh, do so anyway. Hans Otto Portner, who is the co-chair working, of Working Group 2 of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, instrumental in the uh, report on the ocean and cryosphere that was launched last year um, that hopefully many of you saw. Uh, and then finally, and by no means least, uh, Angelique Pompano, um, the Chief Executive Officer of Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust, SACAT, who is situated in the Seychelles mid-afternoon for you there. Delighted to welcome you all um, and that you could join us for this very important discussion and indeed kickoff for this day of ocean and coastal discussions. Um, so with that, maybe perhaps uh, Hans Otto, can I come to you first? Um, you clearly have been at the forefront of discussing uh, and raising the issue amongst um, uh, uh, governments, uh, mobilizing uh, many scientists around the world to really make sure there are that our scientific understanding of the role the ocean plays within climate change is clearly understood and, and indefensible, you know, almost as much as possible. And um, and I think. You know, and I'm sure there are many things that keep you up at night. Um, uh, and I do wonder whether um, you can maybe say, well, what are those things that are keeping you up at night? What is your biggest concern that you have with respect to the ocean and climate um, at this moment? If you just would unmute yourself there. There you go. Just to say thanks a lot, Christian, and, and hello, everybody. If you ask me for my, my biggest concern, we have been praising the role of, of the ocean in climate regulation and especially stabilization. And, and that role is at, at stake because it depends on healthy ecosystems. I mean, we have uh, drivers in the ocean, which I would call the climate drivers in the ocean, which are ocean warming, ocean acidification, and both of them are sort of the other side of the coin of, of this climate regulation service the ocean uh, provides. And we, then we have oxygen uh, loss from the ocean due, due to warming. And, and where these uh, three drivers combine, we call them a deadly trio. If they challenge the organism so much um, that, that they are giving up, that they are um, uh, going extinct in the, respective, in the respective places. And I'm going to this extreme because it has happened in Earth's history. It has happened during mass extinction events in Earth's history and the fossil record tells us about uh, these interactions. So in a, in a way, our current climate crisis is comparable uh, to these uh, paleo climate crises, but it's happening much faster than back then where it took hundreds and thousands of years to develop um, to the extent then to take effect on the organisms. So we are faster. We haven't yet, on human time scales, we haven't yet reached the dimension of those past crises. But this should be a warning sign. There are tipping points to be surpassed for healthy ecosystems. And for, for one of them, we have already surpassed it, which is the warm water calls. And we should stabilize the climate. And with that, stabilize the ocean and, and preserve biodiversity and preserve its capacity to help us because it connects everything on the planet. Mm. Uh, indeed. Um, and that certainly is a, um, you know, these, these warning signals clearly are, are there and, and that we're, I think it's really important that, that, you know, 
the, that, that, that message of the speed at which the change is happening. And in, in previous arena, you know, we're, we're moving beyond geological scale, scales to, to the speed at which the change of the environment is extraordinary. Um, and so obviously that, that, that is something that, that, you know, we need to, um, you know, we need to make clear um, that speed of change. Yeah, just, just maybe if I, I come back to you on, on this, Hans Otto, if I may, um, I, I'm curious, to, you know, to get your sense of the, um, you know, sort of the, the connection. I mean, you know, you talked about coral reefs. You know, could you give us, you know, give a sense for those that are that are watching who may not necessarily, you know, make the connection um, between, you know, these ecosystems and people. Um, and, you know, and actually there, there are real terms, you know, so some may think, okay, we lose a coral reef, it's not going to affect me, but, but it's quite the contrary, no? Well, it, it, it certainly is quite a contrary because it's a global, it's a global system. It spans the, the belt uh, around in the tropics, around the, the globe. Uh, it's virtually found on every continent, if you, if you so wish. And it, it is supporting livelihoods. It, it is one of the gems of biodiversity on, on the planet. And, and it's, uh, it's showing us to what extent a system that is providing services to humankind um, is, is losing its, its capacity. It's protecting coastlines from storm effects. It's providing fish and animal protein to, from the ocean. Uh, to dependent communities, and these are usually uh, uh, communities in developing countries. <clears throat> the capacities there to adapt to these changes uh, are limited, and and it's the whole world should be concerned about the tropics, you know, because uh, one of the first consequences, and we we see this already with with the shifts that are ongoing. I mean, ocean life is shifting, is moving to higher latitudes. And, and the net effect of this will be a clearing of the tropics from biodiversity. And this biodiversity reduction there, we see in the ocean, but we also see it um, on land. It's, it's starting to happen. We are entering what we call the sixth mass extinction event uh, on, on the earth. And, and there is you know, a rich human community that is depending on, on those ecosystem services in, in those areas and that's another urgent call for stabilizing uh, climate and and maintaining those ecosystem services to the extent uh, possible yeah and i think that 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 really sort of speaks to the point that that gonzalo was talking about that we can't treat these necessarily in silos we need to break down those silos we need to understand the interconnections between these uh between these systems and the challenges we face and indeed daniela you know, someone who's been at the, uh, you know, at the forefront of, of really thinking about acknowledging that there are some uh, challenges that are, um, that are being faced by the next generation. But indeed, what you've tried to do with the Sustainable Ocean Alliance is really shift to, okay, we're going to, we, we, we accept that there's a challenge, um, but we want to then uh, prioritize solutions and mobilize, you know, communities to really, uh, uh, rise to the challenge, shall we say, of um, of these solutions, and and particularly the youth community, and then and so some from you, what in your opinion is needed to effectively tackle the challenges that that you were facing and that Hans Otto had had outlined during this um, uh, during this session. Thanks, Christian. Um, so I'll give you three uh, very important, uh, you know, challenges that we have and solutions for that for the matter. So first of all, you know, young people globally have this deep sense of urgency that has never been felt in the past. So you know, when we're thinking about the restoration and the health of our ocean, our goal is to restore the, our, the health of our ocean in our lifetime. And so as we're having these conversations leading up to, uh, to COP26. We want to make sure that world leaders understand that the, the 10, 20, 30 year old uh, milestone timelines that worked for them in the past won't work for us anymore. We really need to be a lot more deliberate and intentional 
and setting uh, shorter timeframes and milestones so that we can tackle these problems. So that's one, just having a deep sense of urgency of this generation and making sure that that is translated to world leaders at large. Number two, we're also seeing the importance of being cross-disciplinary and being more inclusive in who we're allowing to play in this space and who is able to provide solutions to this space. Oftentimes, we, we saw the ocean space as an area where you could only enter if you had a marine biology degree or you had a, a PhD, but that's not the case anymore. We have young people globally that are accountants, that are artists, that are you know, scuba divers, that are um, you know, professionals in their own right that want to contribute. So how can we enable them to contribute? And the only way to do so is by helping them create solutions in their own backyard and using their skill sets and passions. And the third thing I'll say is just, we desperately need an injection of capital into the space. Um, and when, when we look at innovation, at ESO, we look at the whole spectrum, right? We have in the ideation phase, we have so many young people uh, building grassroots projects that need micro funding. And, we, and that spans all the way to, we have companies that are working in R&D for very innovative projects and they need millions and millions of dollars but uh, we don't have enough funders in the space to satisfy all those areas. So that's what we're trying to do is trying to build that uh, understanding and a dialogue with investors and with funders to help them see that we need to tackle every single area of investment in the ocean space. That, that's that's fantastic setup. I'm going to come to Angelique in a second, but there 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 was something that you that you mentioned there. A couple of things you mentioned, Daniela, that I think is really important. Um, you you talked about you know raising ambition, and I think that would really echo with Gonzalo and Nigel. You know about really, you know their kind of daily mantra. You know when they get out of bed and think, what how how are we going to raise ambition, and what kind of communities can we raise ambition? I think so. It speaks to the race to zero dialogues, the urgency. You know. Let's, let's not wait to 2050 to start thinking about this. Let's start thinking about it today. So by the time we get to 2050, you know, we're in a good position. And again, really echoing what, what both Nigel and Gonzalo have said. And I love what you said about cross-disciplinary. You know, I, we, when I was talking, you know, we were talking briefly there with Hans Otto, we talked about breaking down these silos and that inclusive bit. You don't need a marine biology degree. I get lots of young people coming through my door saying, well, I don't have a marine biology degree. Well, you know what? That doesn't matter. You know, you're coming from business, you're coming from uh, psychology, you know, there's a role for everybody. And, and our message is that you're saying is the ocean is everybody's business and therefore everybody should participate. So I think that, that's sort of the great. But what you landed on there, and this is where I'm going to come to, to Angelique, and we'll come back to you again in, in a moment, Daniela. You know, Angelique, you know, um, Daniela talked about injecting finance. And how do we, how do we, we got no shortage of solutions and no shortage of enthusiasm and energy, but we need to have the finance that appropriately meets the scale and the challenge that's being faced by the ocean so we can link into this climate change issues. You have been, you know, you're at the heart of this with a, you know, a, a leading example of the Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust. Uh, reaching your five-year anniversary, congratulations. Um, that is fantastic to see that you're moving from strength to strength. Um, and, 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 and really thinking about mobilizing, you know, resources. And so, so Angelique, um, you know, what do you think has, has sort of, has perhaps led to some of the, um, the successes and drive for investment that you're achieving through, through SACAT, the Seychelles Conservation Climate Adaptation Trust, um, you know, over, over these past five years? Uh, hi everyone. Uh, well, greetings from the Seychelles. And uh, yes, I am actually in the middle of the fifth anniversary celebration. So if you hear some buzzing, it's we've got school children visiting the exhibition. So with regards to um, what are the key pieces that has led to, um, you know, a debt for nature swap, a sovereign blue bond, I definitely have to go back to partnerships. Um, it's been the fact that we've had so many actors wanting to partner. Um, with the Seychelles government, with SECA, to be able to materialize this. Because we know, as a small island developing state, uh, we have our own constraints in terms of resources, in terms of technical expertise. But it's the fact that we've had so many excellent partners come through. So, for example, with the Debt for Nature Swap, we had the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we had the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we had, um, with uh, the Sovereign Blue Bond, we had three private investors, uh, the World Bank, the Global Environment Facility. And now with our latest endeavor, which is a mapping of seagrass meadows across the entire exclusive economic zone of Seychelles. I hope you can still hear me. Um, <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, Love the background noise. Fantastic. It really speaks to what we're talking about. 
you know, <laughs> getting involved. Love it. Go ahead. Um, now we're currently mapping uh, seagrass meadows across the entire exclusive economic zone of Seychelles, where we will be able to actually say by the end of this project, how many gigatons of carbon that these seagrass meadows are, um, are, are storing. And the Seychelles could not have done this alone. Right, we know this. The Seychelles could not have done this alone. It's really been partnership, but really a strong message to countries is that you need to show the ambition. You need to show that political ambition, otherwise the partners will not approach you. And for me, I think those two things have been particularly key. Uh, just to echo what Danielle has said, you know, it, it is everybody's business. And here we've seen uh, private sector, philanthropy, governments, multilateral organization really come in and to support these initiatives. Um, and then finally, you know, it, it boils down to really everyone believing and understanding the, the main cause um, and getting behind it. Um, yeah, partnerships are key. Fantastic, Angelique. And what a, what a, what an appropriate soundtrack um, to have in the background there uh, of children and, and getting them getting involved and, and mobilizing. Wonderful to see that. And I think what you said about partnerships is absolutely right. You know, we cannot go this go at this alone. So hopefully, you know, people are starting to see some patterns here about you know ambition, urgency, inclusivity, partnerships, um, and and you know this is hopefully a, a very nice echo for uh, Gonzalo and, and Nigel as they're listening to this and thinking about. You know they're planning. You know planning going forward. Um, you know, Angelique, you mentioned about uh, you know the, the private sector, and on the line we've got Kim Kupanas, who's the global ambassador for for the B Lab. And um, you know, Kim, uh, you know, you know, I know that that you know you are are someone who is passionate for the environment. You're passionate for people, and you're passionate for business. That is that is clear. Um, and I'm and, and I think that wasn't the case. You probably would not be getting up at three a.m. Um, but um, so we're delighted to have you here. Um, and uh. You, you've you've heard I think everybody talk, um, you know, just to varying degrees about partnerships and the importance for, um, you know, the, the role of the private sector in business, and um, uh, I, I know probably what you're hearing maybe is um, some of it is is new to you and hopefully energizing for you for for two thirds of the planet, um, but but you know what what is the role of the private sector you know in this and really rolling up their sleeves and and going beyond. Um, the talk and really doing the walking in this in this instance. Totally, thank you so much, Christian. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, as as Danielle and you both said, the ocean is everybody's business, and you know, businesses have a unique role to play. Not only because it's bad for business when there's floods and storm surges and hurricanes and tsunamis, but as Gonzalo pointed out, there's enormous opportunity, jobs to be created and economic vitality to come from investing in the blue economy. But you know, the role of business, as my 10 year old would say, is ginormous. The, the opportunities for scaling innovations for the kinds of blue economy investments um, really are huge. And um, you know, if, if, you, if businesses choose to do something for the oceans for no other reason than business opportunity, great. But I would argue that there's, they're uniquely culpable. You know, you look at all of the stats in terms of plastic pollution and, you know, most of the, the, um, the challenges to the ocean right now being caused by business. So, uh, you know, dying oceans are bad for business and it's really important that businesses are uh, taking responsibility for the kind of impacts that they're having there. And there's so much that businesses are doing, but I would argue it's not happening fast enough. They're not doing enough of it. Um, but in terms of what they can do to really oversimplify it, businesses need to stop dumping bad stuff into the ocean and start pulling bad stuff out of the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. There's some really great examples from, from within the business community and specifically the business community that I represent of businesses that are doing that kind of very aggressive, um, innovative work to heal our oceans. Um, and, you know, in addition to just understanding what those impacts are, it's easy to think that if you're not making ocean related products or you're not in a coastal community that uh, dying oceans or uh, the, client, the ocean emergency is not impacting your business. That's just really a false notion because when these kind of impacts happen to ocean communities and, um, you know, you start to see these kind of economic impacts, the ripple effects on your business and your supply chains is really enormous. So there's a lot of upside and a lot of downside and reason for businesses to be invested in healing our oceans. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and, and hopefully that, that you know, that's the sort of language that I'm hoping, you know, that we're all hoping is really starting to resonate, you know, with the, you know, with the business community. Um, I think, uh, um, you, know, you know, sort of picking up on that and, and maybe reflecting on what, what da Daniela said, and Daniela, maybe if I can come back to you on this. Um, you, you know, you heard Kim talk about, you know, this really clear and cogent case for, you know, for business to be involved and, and you know, should be less about putting things in, but more about putting, you know, perhaps, you know, putting things, you know, pulling things out of the ocean, but investing in the ocean the same way, because it's good, you know, good for people, good for business and climate. I mean, Daniela, are you, I mean, you've, you've clearly, you know, laid, a, laid down the, the flag, as it were, in terms of saying, you know, urgency, inclusivity. Um, you know, is this, is this resonating with some of the businesses that you're, that you're speaking to? I mean, are they, are you, are you seeing the uptake that I think sort of Kim is, is talking about there? Absolutely. And, you know, I think that it's even important to take a step back and for us to, to realize how important and special the moment in time that we're in right now. Because when you look at, at the past 100 years, when you think about the marine industry, the ocean industry, the mentality has been all around exploitation and exploration. And that was it. That was what uh, shipping was all about. That was what any industry in the ocean was about. And now we're entering this, this era of disruption and disruption to regenerate and make our ocean sustainable. So we're definitely seeing the shift, not only in entrepreneurs uh, and young people in the ocean space, but also to Kim's point in business leaders and seeing that they're not going to be around the next you know, few years if they don't change their practices. So it, it's truly um, been fascinating to see how there is disruption coming in from the entrepreneurial side, but also seeing how corporates are meeting entrepreneurs halfway and having those conversations of how can we work together and how can we implement um, different solutions. And, and Christian, the, the other thing I wanna point out is this idea of holistic impact so that in the past hasn't been um, really uh, a norm. And when I mean holistic impact, I mean, when we have, for example, an entrepreneur building a solution to tackle plastic in the ocean, they're not just thinking about how do we prevent plastic from entering the ocean. They're also thinking about how does the material I'm using, my, my example um, is Lollywood, um, a seaweed-based technology company, not only are they preventing preventing plastic from entering the ocean, but they're also drawing down carbon by growing their own seaweed farms, right? The same thing goes for another company that is working on tidal energy that is not only thinking about how can we make alternative energy, but they're thinking about how can we add IoT devices to our technology to collect data in the, in the ocean space. So we're seeing such um, such a mix of cross-disciplinary uh, understandings of how can we measure impact and have a positive impact on the ocean, not just from my industry, but across the board. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's really really important. Again, about thinking it, the more holistic approach and integrated approach across across sectors. Um, what what I want to do now is I want to I want to come to I want to sort of pose a final question you know to you all to you know, and you know cast your minds ahead. It is in a year's time. Um, perhaps we've we've had COP twenty six, um, and there've been lots of discussions. And you know what what would you what would you like to see? And this is perhaps a little bit of you know kind of uh, you know raising ambition you know for Nigel and Gonzalo. But what would you like to see, or what would you consider a successful outcome from from COP twenty six? You know, recognizing that you know we we can't have our cake and eat it right away. Um, you know, as as you know, Nigel said, it's about having dialogue, it's about opening doors, and and you know, but at the same time wanting to have the urgency. Um, I, I'd love to get your thoughts, and I'll come to you first, Hans Otto, if I may. Um, you know, very briefly, what what does uh, what does success look like coming out of COP twenty six for you in a year's time? Well, uh, success at COP26 would be a dedicated vote by, by all countries to keep to the climate targets that we have laid out in the 1.5 report. Uh, this includes for all countries to dedicate to the restoration of ecosystems, exploiting the co-benefits that they in, entail in terms of carbon storage, preserving biodiversity, and one that we may not have in mind for the ocean, but it's important on land, actually preserving and protecting us from future pandemics. Mm. So uh, a shift in mentality mm. uh, uh, to, to nature con conservation and, and, and restoration. And all countries should include the oceans in, in their nationally determined contributions yeah. and, and, and exploit the potential 
in addition to protecting the oceans, consider in their, in their conservation measures the capacity of the oceans to, to help us with the stabilization of climate, uh, rebuilding natural resources uh, where we have them e exploited and, and really push for a trend to stop the current shift in baseline that we are seeing from the tropics to the poles. Yeah, wise, wise words, Handano. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And I think that that really speaks to um, you know hopefully raising raising the bar as as um, Nigel has just put in into the chat um, and and really thinking about um, you know, reflecting on the year that we've had um, and the times to come and in how we can perhaps build much more resiliency into the into the system as we address uh, the impacts of climate change, both on land and in, in the sea. Angelique, for you, um, you know, what is what does success look like or what's that what's that ambition? What would you like to see coming out of um, uh, COP26? Uh, I'd like to I'd like to see a, a better understanding by countries of nature based solutions and the role that oceans can play and the actions that they can take. I think what we've I think what we've seen so far is um, is not enough ambition within the NDCs that have been submitted so far. And I would take this opportunity to call on countries. You know, I don't want to wait to Glasgow to see success. I think we have a real opportunity to see su success in those revised NDCs and still continue to aim for the temperature goal. Um, and, and that would be my hope that we are focused on nature-based solutions within the NDCs. Uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, good words and perhaps a natural segue into, into Daniela. Let's not wait around. Let's let, let raise the urgency. Daniela, what does is, what is success look like, you know, according to Angelique, maybe tomorrow, but perhaps next year after COP26? Uh, so in my opinion, um, what I would love to see happen is for governments to develop a blueprint as to how citizens can be mobilized. Mm. Um, because, you know, af after many of these meetings, governments feel as if it is their on them to uh, deliver it at these targets, which it is, but they don't give its citizens enough of an opportunity to contribute. And right now, what we're seeing is we're seeing a mobilization and, and you know, and even a, a movement of people wanting to, to do, to give, and, and they're hungry for it. So I would encourage each government to put together um, a mobilization campaign for their own citizens to take a part in helping us reach these targets and these milestones, and of course, including the ocean and every one of these conversations. Yeah, well, what, a, what a great idea of, of just really coming up with, I think often people sometimes feel that, that these big existential challenges that the world faces at the moment are just, are too much. And I think, especially with COVID at the moment, you know, you sit here and think, oh, you know, I, I, I don't know where to turn, I don't know what to do. And, and maybe that mobilization should be thinking more about, you know, local communities and, you know, and the, that we all have a role to play in some way. And then if we add it up, you know, we might actually, you know, get summer and it kind of speaks to this point of the, you know, that the ocean is everybody's business and, and maybe rounding off Kim with you, um, you know, reflecting on, on what you heard and, um, you know, what is, you know, what does success look like for you, um, you know, at, at coming out of COP26? Yeah, well, I'll just say that I'm so excited for Glasgow. <laughs> um, we, uh, we, the, the B Corp community was really proud to join the Race to Zero at COP25 in Madrid. And we came to Madrid with over 500 B corporations committed to net zero by 2030. And we're hoping to show up in Glasgow with more than half of the global B Corp community. That's over 1700 B corporations, you know, these companies around the world that are really pace setters and, and, are, and are businesses that can show others of every size and sector that it's possible to get to a zero carbon business model. Um, so we hope to bring over 1,700 of them with us to Glasgow um, and to lift up their stories, you know, and to the conversation we're having today, I hope that we have a really robust dialogue and we've lifted up the conversation around the vital role that businesses have in healing our oceans and in um, preserving and protecting coastal communities and their oceans for the decades ahead. Well, uh, fantastic words to end this this uh, panel on. And Kim, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that there you are in the heartland, in the middle of the United States, and you've got a fantastic coastline image behind you on your wall. Um, very apropos and a, a good reminder um, that we've had uh, during this session. Uh, listen, it's been terrific to hear um, your your energy, your enthusiasm, um, you know, real confidence. Uh, you know, with the science, we know what to do. Um, we just need to get down and do with it, and hopefully. Certainly, Hans Otto, hopefully you're energized by your, your fellow panelists that, you know, there's a real 
to do. Let's get this done um, and, and, and really try to, uh, you know, spend this next year um, and beyond indeed raising that level of ambition and raising that bar. So um, I, I thank you um, so much for, for spending this, this time with us. Uh, getting up in the in the wee hours, it really it, it is it is incredible and and um, really demonstrates your commitment, you know, to this issue. So um, with that, I, I wish our, our panelists uh, a, a good evening, uh, a good afternoon, and indeed um, uh, a good a, a very early morning uh, to you. So we thank you again, and hopefully those on the lines will be interested in, in contacting you and, and perhaps continue the discussion and look forward to engaging with you going forward into uh, you know COP twenty six next year. Um, with that, we're gonna we're gonna round off with a with some you know closing remarks from again some extremely distinguished uh, um, uh, members who've been you know involved with this. Not the least of which is uh, uh, Vladimir Rabinin, who is the executive secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the assistant director general of UNESCO, dialing in Paris. Uh, Vladimir, delighted that you could uh, join us on the line. Um, you are leading the charge on the decade of ocean science launching next year. I think everyone's excited about it. And really importantly, um, when, when you read it, it's the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It's connecting it in and making ocean science relevant to everything we do. And hopefully those on the line will have heard the importance of science and connecting it in. So uh, Vladimir, we'd, we'd love some, some brief remarks from you on how you know, how is this, you know, this, you know, this, the science, you know, what it is, is connecting in, you know, to this issue and really driving this agenda forward. Uh, thank you, Christian, also for inviting me to speak to you, uh, you know, and uh, as, as I used to be a real scientist, now I'm a bureaucrat, but at the same time, I, I believe that I kept some systematic thinking. And uh, in, I think we need to, to uh, look at the decade in the lens of what is happening in the world. So, Climate crisis, we all know that it exists. In 2016, uh, the World Ocean, World Ocean Assessment of the United Nations said there is also a crisis in the ocean. We are running out of time to start managing the ocean sustainably. Uh, but there, is, there are some good news. So I would uh, like to thank Hans the Portner for, for leading the work of IPCC and coming up with the special report on, on ocean cryosphere and changing climate. I think it was a, a game changer in the process in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now the door is open to the ocean. Uh, after in 2015, the Paris Agreement, uh, the negotiators agreed to include the ocean in the, in, the, in the agreement. And I would like to describe to you the solution, just uh, probably skipping several steps. The solution to us is that we need to have an the ocean that is managed like we uh, claim that we're able to manage the land, like we can claim to, that we're able to manage the cities with the running water, electricity, roads, traffic lights, and things like this. Ocean needs to be managed based on science and needs to be managed by people who are ocean and climate literate. So this, of course, requires science. Uh, but the current investment into science is of the order of two degrees from the overall investment into science and technology. And uh, you started this, uh, uh, this session by uh, stating that we have 70% of the area of the planet, is, it, it is the ocean, and only 2% of science funding goes there. So we, if we learn how to manage the ocean, and you already, Christian, outlined five areas that will be renewables, that will be decarbonization of transport, uh, management of ecosystems, food, uh, dealing with the food on the sea, you can easily imagine that these all things are quite science intensive. So, in 50 days from now, indeed, the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is starting. The vision of the decade is science we need for the ocean we want. And I already said that we would like to have managed ocean. One of the challenges of the decade is uh, so-called climate and ocean nexus. And we hope that we'll be able to come up with good solutions uh, in, also in terms of adaptation and mitigation to climate change with good spillover effects in dealing with uh, uh, reducing the poverty, uh, reducing the food shortages, uh, improving health of the ocean, developing sustainable ocean economy. So basically there is a vision, there is, there is a possibility to use science and change the tide so the ocean becomes healthy and climate solutions are also visible. 
So on the 15th of October, the IOC of UNESCO, which is the home of ocean science in the United Nations system, came up with a call for action. This call will be open uh, for the programs of, of the decade until 15th of January. So I invite everyone to think about this. Please go to the website Ocean Decade and think how we can design now the science that will be really opening the door for all the solutions that you already outlined, uh, Christian, in the, your introductory talk. Message is that it is possible to solve uh, the climate issue, the ocean issue, and th we need good science for that. And it is uh, really what we are doing now together with the whole world. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much uh, for that, Vladimir. And um, uh, I would have to say that, that having, we need more bureaucrats who understand the science. Um, so uh, you, you are a gem and uh, we need more of your likes to be in the positions that, that you're in. So um, delighted to have your words and very important. You know, as you said, you know, we need to have more investment um, in the science, in solutions. I think we heard that from, from uh, certainly from our, our colleagues and, and really, um, you know, getting others involved. You know, it doesn't have to be the purview of scientists alone. You know, we are going to uh, mobilize many more communities that can be involved, uh, certainly the decade of ocean science going forward. Um, and that hopefully will help the arguments or the, the cases that people like Daniela and Kim and Angelique are working on to mobilize their communities and get them excited about the, the art of possible. So we certainly look forward to engaging you. I, I encourage others to learn more about the decade and how you can get involved um, because it's just not about um, you know, ocean science. It's about what ocean science can do for you and make our lives better um, and our economies richer um, and certainly our planet healthier. So again, Vladimir, thank you so much for, for spending the time with us and we'll look forward to working with you uh, further in the, coming, uh, in the coming year and beyond in the decade. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I am now you know, delighted to uh, introduce our uh, final um, our, our final speaker, uh, who is uh, the minister uh, for um, uh, 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 the UK um, uh, uh, government, who is um, leading the charge on um, the uh, on COP twenty on COP twenty six. Uh, Lord Goldsmith um, has been a, an ocean champion for. Um, for many years, and he is very kindly offered, who um, couldn't join us in person, but has very kindly offered um, a, a video for some remarks. So may I ask my colleagues to play the video, please? Thank you. As an island nation, the ocean matters a great deal to the UK. So it's a real pleasure to be part of making this extended run up to COP26 count. And if it weren't for the pandemic, today we'd likely be reflecting on the closing of the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming, and we'd be welcoming the world to the Climate Conference in Glasgow. And it all seems like another age now, and I think in many respects it is. Coronavirus has changed everything. It is itself likely the consequence of our abuse of nature, but we know it will be dwarfed by the impacts of climate breakdown and environmental degradation. Land and sea. A third of marine mammals are, we're told, now threatened with extinction. Half of the world's seabirds are already affected by the rising tide of ocean plastic, and almost two-thirds of our coastal wetlands are degraded, critical habitats for migratory species right across the world. Now, the ocean is where life began, essential for all life on Earth full of wonders that we've barely begun to understand. And we all depend on it for air to breathe, food, resources, the flow of global trade. But for some, its incalculable importance is much more direct and immediate. And millions of people, as well as quarter of marine species, rely for food and shelter on the coral reefs that are set to disappear in our warmer, more acidic seas. Over a billion people depend on fish as their main source of protein. The world's poorest people depend most on the free but rarely valued services that nature provides. And as they begin to fail, it is they who are hit hardest. By destroying ocean health and taking the world's great fisheries to the very brink, we're undermining our foundations. And turning this trajectory around is objectively, therefore, the principal challenge of our age. And in addition to the many deaths, coronavirus uh, has driven 100 million people back into base poverty. And even those small island developing states that have somehow managed to avoid the virus itself 
have nevertheless seen their economies battered. So the whole world now is having to rebuild. And if there's a silver lining to this pandemic, it's the commitment from countries all the way around the world to build back greener and to build back better. Not in a box-ticking sense. It may means making sustainability the lens through which all decisions ultimately are made. Now we've seen great progress in the technological transition to low carbon. Zero emission vehicles are on the cusp now of going mainstream. Uh, the cost of renewables has plummeted and investment in renewables now exceeds investment in new fossil fuel capacity. But despite the fact that there is no pathway to net zero emissions or the sustainable development goals, without nature protection and nature recovery on a massive scale, we've made very little progress with nature. Nature-based solutions could provide around a third of the cost-effective solutions that we need now, like uh, mangroves we're helping to restore from Indonesia to the Caribbean to store carbon, support fisheries and protect coastal communities. Yet nature-based solutions attract just 3% of global climate finance. As COP26 presidents, we're determined to put nature at the heart of the world's response to climate change. So we're committed to doubling our own international climate finance, and we'll be spending a significant chunk of that uh, increase on nature. And others need to do similarly. And that is important not just for land, but for sea as well. We've relied on our ocean to regulate our changing climate. It's absorbed a quarter of carbon emissions and 90% of the excess heat uh, since caused by human activity. But there's only so long that it can continue to act as a buffer. The UK is set to launch a new £500 million Blue Planet Fund early next year to help eligible countries protect their marine resources and reduce poverty. And our Blue Belt program of marine protected areas around our beautiful overseas territories is on track now to protect an area larger than India. We launched the Global Ocean Alliance last year, inviting every country to join our campaign to protect at least 30% of the world's ocean in marine protected areas by 2030. At the UN uh, a few weeks ago, more than 75 world leaders signed up to an ambitious, radical even, a leader's pledge for nature. It's a commitment to put nature and biodiversity on a road to recovery by 2030. I understand that declaration fatigue exists, but this pledge feels different, more urgent. It explicitly recognises the failure of past agreements, it explicitly invites people to judge signatories on the basis of how they set about honouring its commitments. And it explicitly recognises the need to agree a new legally binding agreement on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in those areas beyond national jurisdiction that make up most of our ocean. I'm proud that the UK played a big role in strengthening that pledge, insisting on the strongest possible language. But the challenge now, of course, is to turn those powerful words into action. Good luck with the rest of your discussions and thank you. Thank you. Zach Goldsmith, Minister of State, Foreign and Common Office, the Department of International Development and the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs for the UK government and ocean champion. If you don't get inspired and enthused and energized by that, I don't know what will. Great words from the minister and that having that commitment for the UK government and hopefully giving you the confidence that the ocean will be a main part of COP26 going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it has been an, an interesting hour to have spent with you. Um, fascinating panelists, hopefully getting you inspired about the art of potential, the solutions that are there, and indeed that you need to be a part of this. Um, we have uh, talked about uh, the importance of science, the urgency, the inclusivity, um, the partnerships that are going forward, the role of business can play, um, the decade of ocean science and getting involved with that, and indeed rounding this off by the commitment that governments are willing to make as far as the ocean concerned.